is my 23rd year in education, science education to be exact. And as I've gone through the years and watched trends come and go, one of the things I've realized can be encapsulated best in a line from a song. Songwriter Paul Brent once said, don't tell me the sky's the limit when there are clearly footprints on the moon. That to me sums up how education can have a role in helping to develop human potential with those we work with every single day, our students. So I'm gonna spend a couple minutes talking with you tonight about three current trends that are sweeping and growing across the nation in the areas of technology, access, and ability, I mean, uh, equitability, in the area of school design, and in the area of accountability. But before we get there, I've gotta make one thing clear. There are people who would tell you that the purpose of education is to create literate voting citizens and future problem solvers and thought leaders for the uh, workforce of tomorrow. And I would disagree with them. I think the product of education is hope and dreams and aspirations. And it's the tools, the knowledge and the skills and the dispositions that we instill in our students that allow them to visualize a future that doesn't yet exist to make them dream of jobs for themselves, and to quote um, Patrick's personal plan, that personal vision. They can dream things that don't even uh, exist in our world today and make them come true if we do our jobs correctly. So let's take a look at how that's going right now. I want to start out by showing you an example of hope before we beat it out of her. This is um, a piece of artwork from a fifth grader here in Knoxville when she was asked to show what she, where she thought science will take us in the future. And when you look at her ideas, she encompasses biology and transportation and energy and there's even a space shuttle going up. So she's thinking in terms of space exploration. And she's only had two years of standardized tests so far, so she hasn't learned that that may not be the right answer and she needs to think closer into the box. <laughs> Which brings me to my first point, the trend in accountability. Thank you. So with accountability, I don't know a single good teacher who is afraid of being accountable for what they do in their classrooms daily with children. What good teachers ask is that we be accountable for what really matters. We have to realize that if we were still creating workers for Mr. Ford's newfangled automotive assembly plant line, thank you very much, the current standardized testing would be fine because it's all about being able to have that uh, widget at the end of the assembly line that looks the same. But what we know about the diverse populations in today's schools is that there are a significant number of students who can pass those tests before they ever walk into my classroom. So if you're measuring my impact on them by their ability to pass that bar, I don't have to do very much to be considered good at what I do. On the other hand, there are students that come to us with learning disabilities, emotional disabilities, home environments and communities that surround them that don't support them in education. No matter what we do, they're not going to pass that same arbitrary bar. But as a teacher, if I move them from point A as far along the continuum as I can in my time with them, I've done my job as a teacher and I have helped build hope and a possible future for that child. So in terms of accountability as a trend to impact human potential, let's measure gain and growth from year to year. That's the true impact of a teacher. Then there's the second issue of school design. Now, with all due respect to Walmart, they are marketing geniuses, but I have a, a phrase that I use, I call it the Walmartization of education. We're building schools that are large, comprehensive places that can serve all needs of all students. And we do this because it's cheaper to build one large building than it is to renovate or build smaller schools and staff them with smaller faculties. When we have a big school with a large student population, we benefit from economies of scale in staffing and other limited resources. And I understand that. But if what we're dealing with is the future of our community, is that really the place that we want to skim? I call it the Walmartization because, well, take Christmas is coming up, the holiday season is approaching. I want to go buy my husband something for hunting, which is his favorite pastime. 
I probably won't go to the counter at Walmart to ask for advice because I don't know anything about the equipment he would need or want. And the person, with all due respect, behind the counter at hunting today is probably going to be stocking housewares tomorrow. If we move away from this idea of education and instead move towards schools of choice, schools that have focus, like the one that I lead, the STEM Academy in Knoxville. All of our staff is there because they have interest and passion in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Same is true for our students. And because of that, I predict we're going to have accomplishments beyond pale when they're compared with uh, the other schools in the system. And it's not any fault of a teacher in another school. But when I teach chemistry first period and ecology second, which was an elective class I took as a freshman in my undergraduate program, so you know enough about science that you can teach ecology, I'm not teaching my passion. And I'm not living up to my potential as an adult learner. And I'm having a harder time instilling the dreams and vision in my students as well. So we need to move away from the uh, Walmartization of schools and instead embrace the trend across the country for schools of choice or specialized schools, magnet schools. They're called all, court, called all sorts of things. Now the third issue, the trend growing across the country, is this one of technology. In his seminal work, The World is Flat, Thomas Friedman referred to technology and access to the internet as the great equalizer, the great flattener of the world. It puts students who are sitting in the Sudan with access to the internet in the same learning environment as a student sitting in New York City, downtown Knoxville, Nashville, Los Angeles, or Paducah, Kentucky. With access to this, we have to redefine what school is. No longer is learning confined to going to that one-room schoolhouse where you have the teacher at the front of the class imparting knowledge into willing minds. Instead, our students are technologically savvy. They're carrying around computers in their pockets that they could access um, online degree components and coursework from their cell phones, iPads, iPod touches. We need to recognize this. Higher education already has. Look at the number of degree programs there are for adults to learn at your pace, on your schedule. Do our children deserve any less? So when we think in terms of this, it makes us redefine what is school. I propose school is not a place. School is a state of mind. It's when we're ready to learn and we're ready to ask questions from the people around us. It is only then that we're going to be able to incite learners to take charge of their own education and develop their own dreams. If we can do uh, embrace all of these things, I encourage it locally as well as nationally, what we're going to put into practice are the words that Nelson Mandela spoke when he said that the greatest fear of man is not that he is powerless, but that he is powerful beyond measure. If we can embrace this energy and this passion in our teachers and in our students, what we're going to find is that our students and the next generation will harness their power beyond measure. And when that day comes, my friends, we're going to realize we've only scratched the surface of reaching human potential. Thank you.